preaching of God's Word this morning will come from the 12th chapter of Mark's Gospel. If you'd open in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, if you need the Pew Bible, this is on page 1080. <clears throat> Begin reading in verse 38 to the end of the chapter. Let us turn to the Lord first of all in prayer. O Lord God, we confess ourselves this morning to be in great need. We are in great need, O Lord, of your word. Your word is inspired, breathed out, and it is profitable unto your church for all times and all ages unto all peoples for instruction, for correction, for training in righteousness. And we desire, O Lord, today to be taught. We desire to think your thoughts after you, to call that good which you call good and that evil which you call evil, and to be in alignment with you in our whole persons. Grant to us now this blessing and let your word be the means of instructing us in the things of God. We pray this for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, let us give our attention beginning in verse 38 to the word of God. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Amen. Thus saith the Lord. Well, if we jump right into this passage this morning, we see first of all that Christ warns us, beginning there in verse 38, 39, and 40, Christ warns us of the sham religion of the scribes. And after doing so, he puts this poor widow forth as an example of true religion, an example of rendering a sacrifice pleasing to God by showing sacrificial generosity in a time of need. What's so beautiful about this widow, as we'll see in a moment, is that it's reflective in such a small way, yet reflective of the kind of giving that Jesus would preeminently display at Calvary for us giving all he had, giving his very self. And in fact, the reason this example is so helpful is because this is the kind of giving which Jesus demands of us toward one another. As we can see here, as he calls this, his disciples to behold this poor widow and take her for imitation, but also, as you well know, through the Gospels as well as through the Epistles, this is the kind of giving, this is the kind of service, this is the kind of love that God has called us to show one another. Be good to all men, says the apostle, but especially to the household of faith, our brethren. So let's take a quick look at what's going on here, and then we'll draw out a couple of lessons and some ways that we can apply it. You find ourselves in the middle of this chapter, Jesus has finished his teaching in the temple courts. He has given his final words of censure against his enemies. In Mark's gospel, which moves rather quickly, his time, his passion, draws and hastens near. We're told now that Jesus takes a seat, in verse 41. He takes a seat on a bench in the women's court in front of the, the donation box where visitors in the temple placed their offerings for the poor. 
There would have been many visitors, of course, at this time, because as you know through the story of the gospel, the story of Christ, Passover is drawing near. It was only days away. Pilgrims would have been coming in from all over the world, all the Jewish men coming in, and they would have been visiting the magnificent temple in Jerusalem. Now, to receive the contributions for the poor, the treasury we know from history and from other sources, the treasury was made of 13 trumpet-shaped brass chests. People would drop their coins into the mouth of this trumpet. It would go clanging down the neck of the trumpet, if you will, to the chest. You can imagine how loud and generous the gifts of the rich must have sounded as they drop large amounts of coins into these chests. Every head would have turned to see who it was and to hear the great sum which they put in the treasury. But maybe you can also imagine how insignificant and unnoticeable the offering of this poor widow would have been in comparison. Think of the hustle and bustle of the crowd. People are everywhere. Animals, people, the noise. Who would have heard the sound of two coins? She brought in, says our Savior, two of the smallest copper coins in circulation in Palestine at the time. Two mites. Mark says it was equal to a penny, which according to some accounts was one sixty-fourth of a denarius. That's one sixty-fourth of a day's wage for a laborer. Hardly worth anything at all. Most of us would be too embarrassed to give so little. Maybe the rest of us would be too judgmental if we saw someone giving so little. And yet so significant was her offering that the Lord called his disciples over to take notice. Truly, he says, I say to you. And he set her forth worthy of their imitation. He declared, in fact, that she had given more than all the rest. Theirs may have made the loudest sound in the chest and in the ears of men, but hers was the most pleasing to the Lord. Now, like everybody else, of course, the disciples would have judged the people's piety and the usefulness of their offerings by the size of it. The more holy would have obviously given more, and the bigger the gift, the more useful it would have been to the poor. The more work could have been done. But Jesus immediately overturns that kind of thinking, and he shows his disciples that God measures piety By the heart. And God's, Jesus here helps us see that the usefulness that something has in the hands of God has nothing to do with its size, but with the willingness of a sacrifice. How small, you remember, was Gideon and his short, his tiny army. How small, of course, was a few loaves and a few fish. In the face of so many thousands. How small and pitiable was indeed the resources available to Moses. Before the eyes of Moses that is. When the Lord said I will feed them with meat for a month. Nothing there. The usefulness in the hands of God has nothing to do with size but with willingness, with sacrifice, as we see here. That's the explanation of the text. That's what happens here. It's such a brief moment. It's a passing notice by Christ, a few words to the disciples, and then it's left to bear upon the hearts and the minds of God's people for all ages. What are we supposed to learn here? I think we can take away two lessons right away. The first is this. We see from this account that Christ sees our actions and our hearts, doesn't he? The verse says, Christ sat and watched the people. He sat on a bench opposite the treasury from which he could take notice of who gave and what they gave. But notice, as the text goes on to make clear, Christ could see so much more than that. Everyone saw that, who gave and what they gave. 
But the text points out in verse 44 that Christ knew whether the people had given out of their abundance or out of their poverty. He knew whether they had given sacrificially and cheerfully or whether just as a mere formality to check a box and give to the poor, duty done. That means that more than their persons and their offerings, their hearts were in Christ's purview. Christ could see the heart. This is an advantage he had, of course, not because of where he sat opposite the treasury, but because of who he was as the Son of God, as the Gospels make so clear, perceiving the thoughts and intentions of a man's heart. Revelation 2 23 says he is the searcher of hearts. And if Christ knew, if he saw and knew the actions in the hearts of men while on earth, seated in the temple courts, dear church, how much more does he see them now? Seated as he is in the heavens as the exalted Lord and judge of all peoples. Christ sees your hearts. He sees who you are. He perceives your motives. Your thoughts are clear to him. Listen to what the scripture says. Job 31 verse 4 says, He sees our ways and he numbers our steps. He sees them as one who sees all things, but he numbers them as one who counts and records them. Hebrews 4.12 teaches us that our hearts are as an open book before his all-seeing eye. The author there says we are naked and exposed before him. Speaking about our hearts. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul declares that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and receive what is due for what we have done in the body, whether good or evil. It would be impossible for Christ to know everything that had been done by each of us unless he took notice of all that we did. Here is the truth of all scripture, but let's ground it right in the text. Notice that Christ knew this woman. He knew her her character. He knew her circumstances. He knew her heart. He knew the sacrifice that she had made. He knew her self-denial. Because he says her giving was all she had to live on. How did he know this? And yet she gave it. She gave it all. Surely It was all she had to buy the day's meals. She forfeited that day's food for all intents and purposes. She gave all she had to live on. And of course, this immediately recalls to your mind, possibly, the poor widow of Zarephath, whom the Lord commanded, you remember, to first provide for his prophet and then for herself and her son. Even for all appearances sake, it would appear as though if she had supplied first for the prophet, there would be nothing left for her and her son. She was called by the Lord through the prophet to give all she had to live on. She did, and you know the outcome of that story. Her needs were met abundantly, and she was never without. You see, the widow's gift in this passage is an act of self-denial which Christ took particular notice, and he commended to his disciples for their imitation. Truly I say to you, of all the people giving today, here is one of whom you should take notice. Here is one worthy of imitation. Now, it's interesting that many have censured this poor widow for various reasons. One would be, would there be anything wrong with her keeping one of those mites for herself? After all, she had two. Maybe one for God, one for me. Well, not necessarily anything wrong inherently with that, but that's beside the point. The point of the passage and the point of the instance given to us by God isn't what she may have done. The point is what she did do and the opportunity that it presented in the providence of God for Christ to call his disciples to take note. And now today for you and I to take note. Christ has put this poor woman's actions and heart forward for all time and he charges his church to take notice of her and to imitate her. This isn't a mere story. It's an example set for the church. We are to imitate her sacrifice. We are to take note of and imitate her charitableness, her self-denial, her others-centeredness, 
her love for God, her love for neighbor, her care for the poor. Indeed, she loved her neighbor as much as she loved herself. But notice also, Christ not only knew this woman, but he also knew the others. He knew their character. He knew their circumstances. He knew their heart, their abundance. He knew their motivation. Verse 41 says, the rich put in large sums. Now, it's good to see the rich give much, because to whom much is given, much is required. They should give more than others. Their provisions are given by God, and they should give back to God in proportion to what he's given to them. Paul says the same in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, as we read earlier. The problem, however, as Jesus points out, was that they gave out of their abundance. It's a way of saying that they only gave what they wouldn't miss. They only gave what they wouldn't feel. In other words, it would really make no difference. They wouldn't have to sacrifice any part of their kingdom, if you will, because it didn't really matter. It's like digging through the couch in the ashtray. You didn't know it was there anyway. Once you find it, it's no real loss. You weren't depending upon it, as it were. It wouldn't disturb the empire that we build for ourselves. In other words, looking at the two together then, their gift was all hand and no heart. Her gift was all heart. Some would say no hand. What is two mites? What is a penny? But the heart, the heart covered it all. The heart overwhelmed the gift, if you will. And that explains why Christ didn't call any attention to their gifts. But for all that men thought of what these rich gave, it was of no account to God because it had no heart in it. While the widow's penny was a sacrifice pleasing to God, Because of the heart with which she gave it. So what does this teach us? But what we've said already. That Christ sees our actions and our hearts. He knows, for instance, what we contribute and give to others. He knows whether we give sparingly or liberally. He knows whether we give and serve cheerfully or begrudgingly. And he knows the principles upon which we give. He knows what our intentions are in giving. He knows whether we give as unto the Lord or whether we give to be seen and acknowledged of men. Whether we give for praise. And you know what happens when you give for praise. Jesus says the applaud of men is all you'll get. There's no reward to come from that. It's not pleasing to the Lord when we give for the praise of men. The second lesson we learn from this passage is that Christ measures our giving and serving. He not only sees, but he measures it. He measured the rich's giving. He measured her giving. He took notice of how much the widow gave. He took notice of how much the rich gave. Now, so did everyone else watching, of course. But not with the same scale. Others would have measured the gifts by their size. But Christ measured what they gave By the heart with which they gave it. But again, let's ground the passage, ground this in the passage itself. The widow's gift was a sacrifice pleasing to God because she gave according to what she had. She could not give as much as they because she did not have as much as they. She gave according to what she had. And this is pleasing to the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 8, we saw this. Paul says a gift is acceptable to the Lord according to what a person has not according to what he does not have. God knows we can't give what we don't have. But we can give what we have. We can give of what we have. In fact, the heart with which she gave was such that you couldn't really measure the amount. Because Jesus says she gave all. How can you measure that? Only God could measure what her heart was. But she gave all. That's how she gave. And in giving the two mites, that's what she gave. Her gift represented, in fact, a whole self being given to God. If she had more, she would have given it. But she gave, because she gave according to what she had. She gave until there was nothing left. 
By contrast, of course, the rich gave what they could spare and wouldn't feel. And they didn't give with a heart of stewardship before the Lord or a sense of dedication unto God or even a sense of love for the poor. They gave for a selfish and sinful purpose. They gave, as Matthew 6 points out, to be seen of men. They gave to be noticed, to be enrolled among the minds of men as good men, great men. What does this teach us? But the divine accounting works on an entirely different principle than human accounting, doesn't it? God takes note of the heart, not of the amount. And this means that God measures our giving not by adding it up to see the dollar sign or adding it up to the amount of hours. God measures a gift by the heart that is in it. This means that God's commands that we give to the work of the church, that we relieve the poor, that we serve the needy, these commands are meant to test our heart more than our pocket. It's not about how much. It's about how. It's not about the noun, how much you give, but the adverb, the manner with which you give what you give. The reason is because God doesn't need our money. God doesn't need our money in order to build his kingdom and provide for his people. Nor does God need your time, your investment, your hard work. God doesn't need any of that. You know this from the testimony all throughout scripture. God fed Israel in the wilderness by manna from heaven and water from a rock. He didn't need anything from anybody. He fed Israel during a siege, you remember, by their enemy's food. He fed Elijah during a famine by a raven. He fed 5,000 and then again 4,000 by a few loaves and fish. You remember our Savior paid his own and Peter's taxes out of a fish's mouth. God doesn't need your money, your time, your investment, your energy, your hard work. God doesn't need our gifts. He already owns everything. And if it pleased him, he could easily accomplish his will and build his kingdom without you without anything from you, without any service. That begs the question, doesn't it? Why then does God command that we give and serve? Why does God call us to give and serve? Why did he charge his disciples and charge his church, love one another, serve one another, lay down your life for one another, minister to one another? Why? Not because he needs these things, but in order that we might bring glory to him. And we bring glory to him as his children when we exercise the graces of love and generosity. We bring glory to him when we learn the graces of self-denial and humility. When we stop building our kingdoms and seek to serve the needs of another. When we defer, as Philippians 2 says, to the needs of others. And think not only of our own. Then Paul says we have the mind of Christ. Don't we? Have this mind in you. He says. We bring glory to God. When we show forth the graces of compassion. And mercy to those who are in need. When we show ourselves to be like Jesus. That brings God glory. He doesn't need these things. But it's for our good. It brings him glory and it does us good because his call to us to serve and give is in order that we might also know the joy of becoming like Christ. The joy of giving, the joy of serving, the joy of putting others first. Our Savior rejoiced because of the joy set before him he endured the cross. For the joy set before us We should follow in his footsteps. These two lessons really stand out. Christ sees all our actions and he sees our hearts. He measures our giving. He measures our serving. I think this morning we can apply this in a few ways practically. First of all, let me encourage you this morning to take comfort. That God sees you. That God takes notice of what you do. We should never do things to be seen of men. But the devil can really gnaw at us 
when we do so many things behind the scenes for which we don't get applause, for which we don't get recognized, we don't get praised, no one knows. There's a part of our sinful heart that want people to know what we've done. We want people to know how much we've given, who we've served, whose need we met. This is all arising from our own selfishness, our own pride. But by God's grace, when we give rightly, and we give for the Lord, not for men, we give to be an instrument in his hands, who cares who ever finds out? It doesn't matter. We're not doing it to be found out, to be known. We're doing it for God. We're doing it out of love for the Lord, out of obedience, yes, but out of love most. Take heart that God sees and takes notice. What a precious verse we find in Malachi chapter 3. Those who feared the Lord and spoke with one another, the Lord paid attention and heard them, and he, a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. God's not up there writing in a book. It's a human way of saying the Lord sees, the Lord takes note, the reward is coming. We don't do it for the reward, but the reward is a reward of grace. And we shall be acknowledged on that day. And his grace shall be acknowledged in us. This was David's comfort in Psalm 139, that God was acquainted with all his ways. This was Hagar's comfort in Genesis 16, that the Lord is a God who sees me. You remember Hagar's need? Thought she was going to die. The Lord came to her and provided, you are the God who sees. What a comfort. She was destitute, alone, helpless. But God saw. That's the way our God is. The Pharisees found their comfort in the applause of men. But this poor widow had no regard for what people thought of her, whether people saw her, she was doing and giving for God. She found an enduring and lasting comfort in God's approval, and so should we. Let it be your comfort this morning that though God's throne is high and lifted up into the heavens, it doesn't mean he can't see you. He does see he does take notice of all that you do for him. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Hebrews 6 verse 10 gives us this comfort. God's not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you've shown for his name in serving the saints. God is not unjust as to overlook the work and the service you've done to the saints. What a comfort. Proverbs 19.17, Whoever is generous to the poor, as this poor widow was, Lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay him for his gift. First Peter 5, verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, this was spoken particularly to the officers of the church, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of, crown of glory for all that you've done in his name. What an encouragement, what a comfort to the officers of Christ's church who are called to serve selflessly. And therefore, as Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And as Paul says, let us be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that work done for the Lord is not in vain. Take comfort that God sees what you do and what you give. Secondly, let me encourage you this morning to serve and give as those who will be called to give an account to the Lord as stewards. For what are we but stewards? Stewards of what God has given us. Regardless of what we have or of what service we can do, we are but stewards of what belongs to the Lord. He owns our talents. He owns our possessions. He owns our time. He owns our money. He owns our energy. He owns our lives. We are His possession, His treasure. The Apostle Paul says, you remember, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. So glorify God in your body with what you do and how you serve. That means we're going to give an account for how we manage what he's put into our care. He's not given each of us the same thing. To the one he gave five, to the other two, the other one talent. But each man was called to give an account for what he had received. And not for what another man had received. And so it is for each of us. We're expected to occupy until the Lord comes by making good and holy use of what he's entrusted to us. So let me encourage you this morning to give and serve as those who will give an account and an answer to the Lord as your master. 
Paul says it this way in Ephesians 6. Your serving should be done, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, that's how the Pharisees served, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, as the widow did, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing, here's the encouragement and the motive, knowing that whatever good anyone does from the Lord, he will receive it back. We are motivated in the scriptures by the reward that is in store for us. Not as a due or a debt from God to us, but as a further gift, a crowning gift of his grace. He says again in 2 Corinthians 8, that you should excel in the grace of giving, which means giving willingly, cheerfully, and generously as a service unto the glory and praise of God. I encourage you to serve and give as the Lord's stewards. Thirdly, this morning, I encourage you to make preparations for serving and giving. We can have great ideas all day long, but unless we make preparations, nothing's actually going to happen, is it? How many things have we thought about and never done? We need to take advantage of the opportunity when it comes, but we can't if we didn't prepare. So I encourage you this morning to set something aside for the needy so that you have it on hand when the need arises, as it will today, in fact, in the deacon's offering. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul says this, Now concerning the collection for the saints, they were collecting for the saints during the famine in Jerusalem. On the first day of the week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. Have it ready, says Paul. Set aside something for the needy. Set aside times in your schedule. To reach out to one another in love and in service. Set aside an afternoon to visit a shut-in, to serve an elderly person. Set aside an hour in your busy schedule to make a few phone calls to the saints, to those who live alone, or for prayer for the needs of those who are hurting. Set aside a morning to go shopping for someone who can't go out, maybe the elderly. Set aside a morning to visit someone in the hospital. Set aside a morning to write cards, send notes. Remembering with joy in your hearts that whatever you do for the least of Christ's brethren is accounted by Christ as if you did it for him. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? We will be like they were in Matthew 25. Lord, when did we see you? When did we visit you? As you did it for the least of these, my brethren, so you did it unto me. There's an account to be given in how we minister to one another and how we treat one another. We will be held accountable for the love that has been poured into our hearts for one another. And Christ will take it as done or not done to him. The Lord's day is a day in which we are to cease from all labor and to worship our God. But the Lord's day is a wonderful day for deeds of mercy. What a wonderful thing to do between the two services at which we meet, but to extend acts of mercy and kindness to the needy. A visit, a note, a call, a word, a meal, anything. So much can be done if we will think to prepare, if we will make a point. So much can be done. Let me encourage you today to take an honest inventory of all that God has given you and then take an inventory of the needs of those around you. And where the two things meet, open your hands and give what you have. And where the two things don't meet, open your mouths and pray that God might supply that need by someone else. Because he has it, doesn't he? He has it and the means as he pleases. And when you feel that you can't do enough to meet someone's need, don't let that be a reason to do nothing. What could two mites do for any poor person? Would have done what little it would have done for her. But so often we think, well, we can't meet the need, and so might as well just do nothing at all. I encourage you to go ahead and do what little you can, because chances are you'll find that the little service you supplied was just what was needed to make up the service supplied by another. So that between the two of you, what do you know? The need was met, wasn't it? Finally, I encourage you this morning to see in this widow's example a model of true discipleship. Join the disciples and look over Christ's shoulder and take notice 
of her willing sacrifice to the Lord. Because true discipleship involves a heart readiness to do what we can, when we can, as the Lord calls and as the Lord enables, according to what a man has, not what he doesn't have. So let me encourage you to imitate her as she imitated Christ, who gave not simply his all, but who gave his very self for you. Imitate her sacrifice and give your whole self to the kingdom of God. Imitate her charitableness. Give willingly. Give sacrificially. Give cheerfully. Imitate her self-denial. Look away from what you need to what others need as well. Imitate her love for God and give and serve as unto the Lord. Imitate her discipleship to Christ. And offer yourself, as a, offer yourself up as a sacrifice pleasing to God by laying all that you have and all that you are at his feet for his disposal, for his glory. Lord, I'm yours. So I encourage you today, whatever your status, whatever your provisions, it really doesn't matter. Purpose to be rich, as Paul says to us all, to be rich in good works. Remembering that as much as the world around you stands in need of your generosity and should be the recipients of it as God calls you. Your own church is your first priority and should be the first to benefit from your service. Begin at home because here's where we learn to give. Here's where we learn to sacrifice. Here's where we grow and mature our gifts so that the world may see. What will the world come to see? How we have loved one another. And it looks just like the way that he has loved us. That's how he gets the glory. But if we're so busy trying to take care of everything out there and neglecting what's in here, how does that look like Jesus? It doesn't. This looks like Jesus who came and laid down his life for his people. Let us pray this morning that God will make us willing, willing servants, cheerful givers, that we might render ourselves pleasing sacrifices to the Lord. And by that love we have for one another, we might unmistakably show ourselves to the world to be the disciples of Jesus Christ who loved us, says Paul, and gave up his very self for us. Here is a pattern, but it's patterned after his pattern. And he is the one set before us ultimately. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for your grace to us, a grace that abounded, O oh Lord, in your giving, your all. You had one lamb, one son, and you gave him. You held nothing back. You gave all you had. And he himself, likewise, gave all he had even his very self. Though he was rich, he became poor, that we might be rich in him, rich in grace. Let us, therefore, as your people today, excel in the grace of giving. And may it begin, may it be manifest, may it thrive and come to glorious fruition right here where we are in our midst in this church. For Jesus' sake, amen.